Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my, my apologies, it's all going to get slightly technical now, um, but hope, hopefully um, some of it will be uh, relevant to your fields of interest. Um, this isn't a sales brochure um, for any of our products, but we do have to establish credentials to some extent. Um, after that, I'd like to look at um, hybrid electric vehicles, their forecast, and how um, uh, the technologies that we see um, either in very early research from understanding the patent activity that people are undertaking at the moment um, would then pa paint uh, a map of what we would see up to 2030 and beyond. We then look at <coughs> new transmissions. If that's, your new cha if that's a challenge, how would you go about it? We pick out a couple of examples from OEMs. Um, it's particularly to do with uh, transmissions for uh, hybrids where maybe you're looking at one hybrid transmission that also has to um, span um, conventional powertrains and the penalties you suffer is trying to have a, um, a, <coughs> a modular system. Then we move on to some of the advantages of trying to better understand duty cycle in, f duty cycle in, in, in the future. Um, we think there is quite a lot of CO2 left on the table for want of a better understanding what true duty cycle is whilst trying to balance uh, the risk of uh, in-field failure. We then re really get to the bit that I have greatest interest are, are, are both subsystem examples, what could be the, uh, some of the elements you'd hang on the conventional architectures of DCTs, ATs and so on in the future. And then you realise that this is beyond a person. Um, the number of combinations uh, beyond the uh, analysis which uh, Romac showed us this morning um, move into the many hundreds of millions if you to do it in at all any degree of thoroughness and to uh, warrant to your customer that you found the best answer. Then we'll look at a couple of examples, one for an AT, one for a DCT that we've run through this process and then move on to testing both for durability and some of the other aspects that uh, we'll, we'll find there as well. And then everyone has assumed that gearboxes cost you money. Well, yes, they do, but maybe you can charge a bit more if they have some specific features that are evident to a customer. And then there's some conclusions. So as the first part of kind of a credentials, um, we, 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 we design, we manufacture, we test, and we support the application of automotive gearboxes. Um, this is about the only slide that's um, bereft of lots of, lots of text. Um, the only bit that matters is that logo there. That one's some car manufacturer. What it, what it means is we're the first volume or low volume, but nonetheless series production producer of DCTs in the world. And that started with uh, the help of some of the people I recognise in the, in the audience, uh, particularly I think Marco, who will be um, discussing things with you later. So we've done a little bit of this before. How do um, some of our customers, the OEMs of the world, go about this? Now, GM and Mercedes are some of the few companies that manufacture their own gearboxes. And in the most cases, they'll buy it in as a commodity, but they do it in-house. And let's have a little bit of a look at how they went about it. We'll do that in a moment when we've had a look at some of the uh, future technologies. So, <coughs> in the future, these are projections which are reasonably accepted within the European Union for the um, <coughs> domination or penetration of different hybrid technologies. Here are the, the combinations of gasoline and diesel, which means that even at 2030, the upside projection of hybrid electric vehicles is 25%. So there's a strong probability you'll still be wrestling with a P2, possibly P3 architecture, and you've got a modular arrangement. I think this is a reiteration of some of the um, penalties that will be suffered. 95 grams we've heard about. If we go further, now these aren't finalised, but this is projected and this is in discussion. These are very, very difficult targets to meet. And some of the technologies we uh, touch on today um, may well allow us to approach this 70 grams, some around this region, but that part something big's got to give. Um, now it could be that you're looking at a, a kinetic energy recovery system that, that John Hilton talked about. Mm -hmm. And if that works sufficiently efficiently, then mass of the vehicle doesn't matter because you're capturing everything. So mass can then start to be less of an issue and you may concentrate on other aspects of the vehicle architecture. 
However, if we dive back into the world of gearboxes, then we look at all the usual variants continuing with a kind of an arms war in number of ratios. It's very much like Gillette razors, I think. Um, but we actually look at the sensitivity of these a little bit. Is 10 a marketing gimmick, or is there actually some advantage? And actually quantifying that and um, uh, talking a little bit about some of the assumptions around that, I, I think sheds a little light on it. However, what we are confident in, if we're looking at EVs, then we're looking at much simpler gearboxes. So then you naturally have um, a divergence from the idea of wanting to have something that's modular between conventional power drones and hybrids, and something that actually meets both of them adequately, rather than penalising both. Some of the subsystems that we believe will be hung on whatever the stick diagrams are that define these are all the sort of good ideas we've all been having, but as yet are not necessarily available from the Tier 2 suppliers into the Tier 1 gearbox supply chain. We'll talk about some of those and try to um, quantify some of them. But one of the parts that I'd particularly like to ad address is this issue of duty cycle. If you have a new vehicle, you're very reluctant to take any risks with an infield failure. However, is that because you don't really understand how it's being used? Do you have a new market? Do you have a new demographic? Will the PlayStation generation drive cars in completely different ways to those that of us who grew up trying to make a manual gearbox last 200,000 miles and treating it very gently? Who knows? But if you had a, a piece of software that allowed you to investigate that, put in different driver de um, demographics and their um, particular uh, driving styles, integrate that with traffic, then maybe you'd be a bit more confident in moving towards an optimal system. <coughs> the same kind of arrangements may be applied to conventional and uh, more avant-garde uh, heavy-duty vehicles. But I think generally it's very difficult to see anything if, you, if your drivers are sufficiently skilled to make a manual gearbox work and you give them a gear indicator, maybe you incentivize them in their pay packet to drive efficiently, then an AMT is unnecessary. But if you want to protect the gearbox, then that's a very, very good trick. And that's why in certain markets where um, <coughs> driver skill may, may be less than perhaps we enjoy in Europe, then that's a very good way of um, avoiding warranty. But it, Trying to move beyond those kind of arrangements is, is, is um, a, a quite a, a technical challenge in terms of c convincing people they need to move. If you look at uh, agricultural systems, power split fent transmissions would provide a very interesting um, transmission for delivery trucks. But at the moment, it's just not on anyone's radar well, at the moment. So we now move to a a new transmission. How did General Motors go about it? Now this is public information from a paper they published I think at CTI, um, a much lesser um, organisation than the robust IMEC E obviously, um, and, and they did so in the States. <coughs> but it shows, and it, it's very candid, about the way they started with their, their current six speed. And if we count up one, two, three epicyclics, and one, two, three, uh, four, maybe five, five um, clutch or brake elements, they thought they would just tweak parts of this to get to a, an 8-speed that provided all the things that it required, ratio range, um, only shifting two um, clutch or brake elements at once, three becomes a controls nightmare, and, and so on. And they're very candid about spending some years pursuing this with a large team of people and then abandoning it and going to a synthesised transmission, which was effectively take all the options and just plod through them and take a cost function for each of these until you get the right one. But in doing so, they had a lot of delay and that delay cost them all sorts of things, not least of which were CO2 penalties. So let's look at something that we, we've been involved in. And I talked about the simplification of a um, transmission for a hybrid. This is something that was, we, was designed and then built, and similar kind of arrangements. These are much simpler, three, four speeds. In fact, on one of them, the single <coughs> speed, it's just single speed for one, one of the ratios, or one, one clutch only um, takes one speed from this D DCT. The kind of things you have to deal with, though, even on a simple gearbox like this, are NVH. You've suddenly got nothing to mask the, the gear whine or any other noises that would normally be uh, covered, by, certainly in some frequency bands. Um, 
you may have nothing to heat it up, so the viscosity of the oil stays high for longer. And in a study in Detroit, where during the wintry months no gearbox ever gets towards 45 degrees centigrade, it's around 3% fuel penalty for the gearbox for running cold oil. And yet in the hot summer or towing a vehicle out of Death Valley, you'd kill it if you ran anything thinner. So there's a, a, a great deal of um, challenge in even simple hybrid architectures. But I think I'll come to the, the final point. If 25%, only 25%, by 2040 of your vehicles are, 25, are, are, are um, hybrid, then really you've got to start concentrating on the mainstream and seeing the others as an add-on, or doing a, an entirely separate gearbox, maybe a bit of, under a bit of a teaming agreement with some other interested OEMs. <coughs> so, duty cycle. I've kind of explained I thought this was important. Current durability, that kind of realm. 250,000 miles for a manual if you drive it carefully. I seem to remember getting slightly more as a student. And about that for a, a, a taxi-driven automatic. Really, 15, uh, 150,000 miles would probably be enough. Now, if you then assume that a 10% reduction in duty cycle gives you these kind of numbers, about 200% life in bending of the gears, surface contact, you come through all these bits and pieces, it's worth about 0.4% CO2 on the NEDC cycle. So if, I'm playing with numbers a little bit, but if you could take half of it, it's not linear, but you're going to start saving significant full percentage points of CO2 without having done anything that affects the driver or really affecting your, your gearbox design. So understanding that really matters. And how do you do that? Well, conventionally, um, companies build up enormous databases of the ways their, their vehicles are used. However, if you've got a new hybrid, you're putting it into Shanghai. Your customers have a particular um, driving style. You have no idea how that vehicle's driven. So the only thing you can do to be robust is to ensure that you effectively wind up the safety factors on everything and design a ridiculously heavy, inefficient gearbox. But at least it hasn't broken. But you haven't, then you've suffered enormous penalties because on a certain mass class in China, if it doesn't meet a target, you can't sell it. So you're kind of damned both ways. <laughs> what we've developed is a piece of software which allows us to define a route. There's the elevation of it. You put the driver type, you put in some traffic, and you then drive, let it drive across all sorts of drive cycles, all sorts of people, and you end up with the drive line loads. Great, now we understand those. You can then do statistical analysis on that, and out of it you end up with a duty cycle to which you then uh, design your gearbox. You can then decide to push that much, much closer to a risk of failure, but you might only do that for 2% of your customers. The 98% then so the gearboxes survive. And we're talking about a failure in the field with sufficient prognostic systems, then you can have the best of both worlds. 98% of customer gearboxes never suffer a risk, 2% do, and you have those monitored by low-cost prognostics. And that's one of the topics we'll come on to uh, shortly. So, <clears throat> if you design your gearbox for a particular duty cycle, then you can start looking and taking advantage of some of these extreme non-linearities with gear efficiency. Everyone tends to be keen to put a, gear, a, a fixed number in for, in simulation for gearbox efficiency, and I was delighted to see that Romax were showing non-linear maps. Um, at part load, you might only be 40% efficient as you total around an NEDC cycle where you only need 44 newton meters. But because it's got to do 0 to 69 seconds, you've got to accommodate that level of torque. So that's the kind of penalty you're losing in your gearbox. And where does it go? This is a sort of a, a breakout of the energy sinks. An awful lot of it in gear churning, a lot in bearings. All these are varied to some extent by duty cycle. And there are a variety of tricks that can be applied to um, diminish those. Not the conventional ones of just trying to uh, dry sump systems, but some, some other things that are, are being developed at the moment. Then you come to the tricky question of adding these all up to give a cumulative bomb cost, so you only buy the technologies that are of good value. And this is vehicle efficiency improvement, and this is incremental bomb cost. And even then, what numbers are you putting into this? You're putting into numbers that, now this is to do with synchro clearance, a fairly critical aspect. The greater the clearance, the less the drag on all the open gears. So you have a 10-speed DCT at any one time, 
nine of those synchros are just chewing up energy and are long for the ride. Well, how much should you space them by? And then how, what impact does that have on the um, overall uh, package installation of your gearbox? Again, it's not really suggesting that 10 speeds is, is the right way to go. But if you're able to then test and verify some of those numbers um, from uh, entirely trusted um, suppliers, but they are trying to sell you something, not necessarily make your gearbox more efficient. You might want to test that. Other things you could do, just look at the kind of Optistruct output for the front end of a, a, a gearbox. Most of the material has been depleted here and isn't needed. You just use it to keep the, the rain off the clutch and the noise in. Now that could then be shrouded. We call it a kind of a skeletal system. We're not the only people talking about this. But as a rule of thumb, 10% vehicle mass is worth about that kind of CO2 reduction. And it's two penalty levels. That means a kilo is worth up to about five euros. So you, if you can get a couple of kilos or half a kilo out of something, it, it starts having an appreciable value. And again, you've done nothing to upset the customer. The customer still is delighted with their, with their gearbox. What else might you do if you had hybrid machines synchronizing different elements for you? Well, at the moment, I'm struggling to think of any of the P3 hybrids that doesn't use a wet clutch. Well, if we, know, if we now just need to provide a, a, a torque transmission but no slipping energy dissipation, then this arrangement for a DCT, where we effectively drive in from the engine onto this driven plate and we can drive this DC, the input or this one in a dry manner, then that may provide a very compact solution. If it has some heat to dissipate, then we can take it through a heat brush onto one of the shafts and warm up the gearbox oil. This isn't available at the moment. This is nothing but a glorified cartoon until somebody wants it, whereupon it will suddenly become reality, I'm sure. Um, going one stage further, it's a rather a pity to have these bearings here because first of all they cost money, they create drag. <coughs> if we're able to generate clamp, so this is from the engine, this is the, the clutch plate off into the gearbox. If we're able to clamp between the green and yellow elements by applying a magnetic field around this circuit, then we generate a, a magnetic slip, but we don't have any bearings. Moreover, we don't have any levers. We don't have any build-up of accumulated tolerance due to wear and so on and so on. We did a little bit of simulation, even at high temperatures, and that arrangement <coughs> seems to work. So looking further forward, we may well be able to apply different technologies and get different answers. So this is what the part that um, gains my, my, my greatest interest, because this is the kind of numbers of candidates we need to look at for a 10-speed AT, about 300 million. Now, that's not to do anything to do with the number of combinations of applications that were talked about by Romax this morning. Um, that's just the number of clutches and the topology combinations of the gears. Epicycle can be joined in three ways. Clutches can be positioned relative to an element or ground. Put it all together, and that's the kind of search you need. Now, the approach we take is to um, winnow out all, all of those to get the last top ten. And that works pretty well. The next part that requires greatest development is the gearbox designer. At the moment, I'd like to take the designer out of the loop, take what's in the knowledge of an experienced designer, so we can look at all of the stick diagrams that come out of that and automatically apply a level of design to them. That's getting there, but at the moment, if we can winnow that down to 10, from that number to 10, and we have to then involve some des real designers before we then go through gearbox efficiency, CO2, and end up with packaging cost, then we end up with <coughs> a confident best of the top 10. Now there may be some other preferences to do with manufacturability and so on that come into that. But that process has worked um, reasonably well. It's not, a, it's not a product, it's a process at the moment. There's too much manual intervention to make it work, but it's where we're going at the moment. One part that I think has been generally missed, and when I was involved in hybrid simulation, this is the part that bugged me most, and someone much cleverer, along, cleverer came along and sorted it out. When you've got a hardware candidate, you then have to control it around a drive cycle or according to some statistical combination of drive cycles. This is a technique known as dynamic programming and it allows us to be confident. It doesn't give you an algorithm at the end, but it does say for that candidate, this is the best CO2 you'll get from it. Right. Once you've then winnowed, you've winnowed down to the last 10, you can then develop more complex algorithms, but it's a very useful starting point. And again, it takes the engineers out of the loop 
allowing you to do automated search. So, this was an example of um, a ZF8 8HP, which is in a lot of current JLR products. And we were charged by an, an, another client for a truck and bus combination, um, a very um, uh, unusual application of uh, planet trees. Would this work? And unfortunately, you can't get enough of a low first gear on this. So we looked at a variety of approaches, and this is where we <coughs> came to. And that was the answer. Um, this was the last 10, where we then uh, involved the client to involve a lot more um, soft negotiation. So we gave some very hard rules, and then they started applying this um, AHP analysis, which is kind of QFD taken a little bit further, um, to allow us to then come down to a preferred and agreed solution. And that's what we then proceeded with. Now, 10-speed DCTs, VW are launching one, or already have. Why, why would they want to do that? Um, this is shows the gear steps on an engine BSFC map um, for um, a standard shift map and a more optimised one. But I want to just show where they, the, the potential fallacy lies. If you have an engine or a transmission drag model which doesn't adequately show the penalty for having all these open gears all churning around and uh, shearing oil in synchronizers and so on, then you end up with this kind of characteristic where from 6 to 16, it doesn't actually show much of a benefit. If we went back to the previous um, map, that's because they're fairly flat BSFC maps. In the past, they were much peakier, but now, if you're in with these islands, it frankly doesn't matter whether you've got a gear here or a gear here. It's the same. So you're, 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 it's just pure marketing. If you introduce more of a penalty for those gears, and this is a, just a line I've drawn on to make the point, then you end up with a bathtub. And it's somewhere between 6 and 10, but it's not as high as 10. That's what I'll, I'll generally say about uh, the number of gears being a good or bad thing. If, however, we then apply within that configuration um, a 10 kilowatt, a single 10 kilowatt machine, then we can be confident that we, in combination, will get about 8% fuel economy. So these are not ifs and maybes. We've gone through a very um, exhaustive search um, with very clear assumptions, and that leads us to these conclusions. And I could have shown these to start off with, where the kind of things that are done to maintain compactness for DCT, so this is axial length, here's the clutch pack, is to look at concentric lay shafts. So rather than having solid lay shafts, in order to get um, 10 gears in a small space, we then have to actually play some of the tricks that planetaries use, which is to make nesting <coughs> arrangements. And this is the kind of thing where even if that was the best idea, one of our engineers has got to go through all the gear combinations just to check the kinematics. If he makes a mistake in going through these 300 million combinations, well, it won't be for this DCT. That's probably in the range of about 100, uh, about 100, 100,000 maximum. Um, one mistake, he could um, miss um, potentially the best solution. So having synthesis, synthesis software to first of all generate it and then assess them is a very useful tool. Incidentally, we can also build into that no-go areas if we understand a particular design is um, subject to patent coverage. So we can codify the layout of a, a transmission and avoid you know, the embarrassing situation of um, a chief executive having to ring up another one and ask whether he can do a trade. So the kind of arrangement ends up looking like this, and then we apply all the clutter that stops it looking like an elegant gearbox, we apply all the actuation system to it, and it becomes almost unassemblable. So, <clears throat> the kind of things we are involved in when we're testing. We've looked at lots of efficiency maps, and we've seen examples of those. Um, also, if it happens to be a tractor, and this is a, um, a system that actually someone else in the audience was involved in the assembly of um, a few years ago, um, has to go up an incline. And suddenly you find you need 30 litres of oil where you didn't before, and that has to be kept somewhere, um, and so on and so on. So there's a requirement to do durability testing, lubrication testing, and so on. Um, and just anecdotally, this was a specialist piece of um, a, a hybrid drive line for a 30-ton military vehicle. <coughs> and at minus 30, 
the key was turned and it wouldn't move because the oil viscosity in all the clutches was sufficiently high that the engine couldn't move it until that bit was warmed up and then it went fine but um, it was a little bit disappointing that uh, something like that could be <coughs> overlooked and neglected by a company that's some experience of doing these things <coughs> so testing yes we do durability testing it t it's expensive prototypes are very expensive it takes time and money um, and we heard some very interesting presentations this morning from, from uh, Loughborough um, about oil film from a, 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 a predictive perspective. And they're quite right. Back in 1980, first uh, capacitive tests were actually applied to measure the oil film. And we're now at a stage where this is something I've been doing on a wind turbine to actually bounce ultrasonics off every interface steel to roller. So we're actually using this sensor array of ultrasonics to send and receive ultrasonic waves and it bounces off both this side of the roller and the outside so we can measure the oil film on the roller on the inside and outside and that's been known for some 10 years what's been recently published is brand new is actually being able to use the same technique to measure the deflection of the elastic deflection of the material in the contact patch so we actually understand the load under that roller if we understand the load under the roller then we can build up a life model for the, that particular part of the bearing and that means we can build it into a much more detailed <coughs> prognostic system. So now, depending on how you arrange the, the sensor systems, you may be able to have both your cake and eat it in terms of the um, reducing the duty, the, the design, the torque capacity and uh, life of the gearbox, but actually monitoring it somehow, especially during uh, development. This is a piece of work which Loughborough, Sheffield, and a few of us were all involved in some years ago, and it just shows that it's a great pity that the engine guys have made use of this before we have really. Now these are a, an array of sensors on the wall of a, um, a fired engine and this is the crank angle and this is oil film thickness in microns and it gets down to zero. Now as soon as the engine's warm you take your measurements oh crikey it's going to fail. Stop the test. You don't need to do a thousand hours anymore because you know it's going to fail. You haven't blown an engine up and you've got your results much, much earlier. So the idea of using intelligent sensors to understand the life implications of things like thin oils in gearboxes and engines is, it seems to be a, a, a very important step forward. The other part is actually measuring things like synchros and seals, and this is a little bit of a rig we're putting together at the moment, to measure the drag on a seal, which isn't very much, but it's a sensitive piece of equipment so we can assess the ability, the seal function primarily, and then also look at the drag that it generates whilst doing that, rather than relying on anybody else's information. So, profit from transmissions. <coughs> Years ago, when I was much lighter, I used to enjoy climbing. Um, since then, I've had some tricky moments with cars going up hills. I've mixed a couple of things together here. I think it was the, the, the wrap spring is a form of bistable clutch that is very well known. It's used as a decoupling element within um, within shipping drive lines, and 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 there are about 35 of them in every photocopy you walk past. So it's a one-way clutch that just you apply a little bit of load here, and it generates um, the torque equal to the tensile strength of the the spring. Now, we put this as an anti-rollback device in a car and we measured the rollback at 5 millimetres. We also took a Ford AMT and measured 600 millimetres. So the rollback, just in terms of safety, um, is, 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 is quite, quite dramatic. What our interest in is, is the refinements that something like this could bring when you're doing something like that. Now the current brake systems tend to creak, they tend to provide uh, um, a little bit of a, um, a questionable confidence to the driver when he's manoeuvring something like this. And frankly, if he slips back a foot here, it doesn't matter. However, if you're manoeuvring over rocks, five millimetres roll can be quite disconcerting. So if we're looking at ultimate systems, these are features which, when properly marketed, could perhaps provide a little bit of extra revenue. And it's interesting how VW have created a sub-brand of DSG within their uh, marketing portfolio. Who would have thought that Gearbox would get its own name and it'd be used to uh, provide incremental profit? But it has, and um, we see other, other areas for that as well. So, in conclusion, um, gearboxes have got a day job to do, but we're asking them to be effectively the, the torque connection hub within modern hybrids. 
with some general truths. Um, there's lots of pub talk about what's best. Multi-ratio DCTs have better efficiency than ATs. Yeah, that's, I don't think anyone can argue with that. <coughs> On the whole, ATs will be more torque dense because you've got the planetary load sharing arrangements. <coughs> These are pretty much, whenever you're advised which are the best or less effective transmissions, these, these, these truths really do still pertain. Um, I think when we were at six and seven speed gearboxes, it was within the, 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 the mental capacity of designers to actually design such things. Uh, that we're, we're beyond that now, um, both at the, the gearbox level and then their integration within a, a full drive line. Um, some kind of synthesis and matching and optimization is required. Um, subsystems can also be a very important part. Once you've got the right layout, then all of the other elements can have um, a similar effect. I think we'll stick our neck out a little bit and say the 0.4% CO2 penalty is a little conservative and that if you wanted to compromise certain aspects of life, you might go a little bit further. But finally, really, how many gears is optimal? You better ask marketing because that's not an engineer's answer anymore. <laughs>